not on it is mine. Hallelujah. Somebody give him that praise. Yes. How many of you believe you are a chosen generation here this morning? We are a chosen generation called forth to show his praise. Hallelujah. We are a chosen generation. Called forth to show his excellence. All I require for life, God has given me, and I know who I am. Somebody say we are, we are a chosen channel. I 
Your presence full of joy. You, 
this morning we thank you for your power that is present to transform to heal to restore and to bring deliverance to your people Lord we thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit that is right here right now with us to bring an impact into our lives we thank you for your power that is present even right here with us we thank you, God. We worship you and give you all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody go ahead, give God some praise. Come on, give him praise. Let's give him praise. He deserves every praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. God bless you all. Let's take our seat and um, hallelujah. We thank God for yet another beautiful day like this. You know, uh, <laughs> the past few days have been quite um, a unique type of weather, Pastor Helen. I tell you, it's been brutal. It's been unbelievable. I mean, I woke up yesterday morning to negative three. And I tell you, I couldn't move. <laughs> it was so cold. And I was like, well, you know, we, we had a heat set up to 85. I think we were even past go, uh, the dial. You know, the numbers on the dial, we were going past it. And the room wouldn't be warmed up past 60 degrees. And uh, I said, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> Amen. Why don't you turn to somebody this morning and tell the person it's good you made it to church? And tell the person you and I are actually the church, not the building. And so when we come to church, tell the person when we come to church, 
it means you and I are together. It's not about a building. It is about we coming together, which attracts the presence of God. Tell the person, I know God is here this morning because we are fulfilling what his word says. Amen. Amen. I welcome everybody this morning into the house of the Lord. Those of you that are joining on Zoom, uh, some of you on Facebook, some on YouTube, I welcome all of you to be part of what God is doing here this morning with us. And I know the power of God has no boundaries. Amen. So even though you might be at home watching from work, wherever you might be this morning, I want you to know the power of God is present and that power of God is going to minister to you. If you believe it, say yes and amen. Yes, amen. 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 This morning we have some beautiful people visiting us in the building. Uh, first of all, our Bronx campus is here. Let's put our hands together for them. <laughs> amen. And uh, we, have, we have a beautiful family joining us from the Bronx campus. Brother Jasper and the family, beautiful. I, I met them this morning and I'm already excited about what God is doing in their life. Thank you so very much for coming. And I'm looking forward to uh, getting to know what God has intended for you and your family. But I know God's hand is upon you and your family and I bless God for you. We also have here Brother Thompson. Uh, Crompton, because of the music, I couldn't hear it. Brother Crompton, thank you so very much for coming. Minister Ike invited him, and we are excited to have you here. Thank you so very much. Let's put our hands together for them. I also have a couple here. It's so amazing. We've been having this great fellowship, but I haven't even taken the time to even ask the man's name. I know the lady's name, uh, Sister Brenda, and he, she's here with, with the husband. You know, we've been doing real estate for some time. We've been doing some real estate transactions. And, you know, when you are called into the kingdom, even though you are in the marketplace doing what you got to do, you must still represent the kingdom. Amen. So even though we, we're doing real estate business, we, we always will have time to talk about a gospel and, you know, share. And then, you know, I invited them a few weeks ago, and today they are here, Sister Brenda and the husband. Thank you so very much for coming. Let's put our hands together for them. It's a great joy to have you both here. Amen. And if anybody is here today worshiping for the first time, we want to say God bless you for coming. And guess who else is in the house? Brother AJ. <laughs> oh, come on, let's celebrate God for Brother AJ. We miss him so much. And uh, today we are excited. You know, every morning I would text him and find out, should I pick James to church? And today he said, you know what? I'm coming. <laughs> and we bless God. Well, we're ready for the word. I know the word of God is able to transform. The word of God is able to take us from where we are to where God wants us to be. Our God brings fresh revelation every time. You cannot be too used to the word of God. Familiarity will become the greatest hindrance from receiving from the Lord. So you can never have enough of the word. You must always be ready for fresh revelation. And I've always said that you can never just read the word and walk away because the written word must always lead you to the living word. Amen. Hallelujah. And the living word is Jesus Christ. So you can never come into contact with a written word and go back the same. You must encounter the living word. If you are the, like the woman of the world, you must encounter the living word that impacts you to the degree that your entire community is impacted and brought to the well where Jesus is ready to deliver the word. Hallelujah. Why don't you lift your right hand and say, Lord, speak to me. I'm ready. Lord, my heart is open to your word. Lord, speak to me this morning. In Jesus' mighty name. Well, if you've been part of this ministry, our assignment as the Lord gave us is very simple. God is ready to take ordinary people and use them powerfully for his glory. That is what the kingdom of God is about. And I've always said that if your blessing is enough for you, it doesn't reflect God. My blessing can never be complete in Christ until the blessing God brings my way, brings him glory, number one. And number two, brings a blessing to other people. 
And so as a ministry, we are called to love God and also to love God. And not only that, loving God must never be complete until we begin to love the people God places in our life. And so we love God and we also love people. Amen. Hallelujah. That is what God has called us to, to love him and also to love people. And a good number of people want to show their love for God, but do not want to manifest that love towards people. And you don't have to know people to love them. You can love everybody because Bible says that we must even love our enemies. And Jesus didn't teach it without leaving it because on the cross, whilst he was dying, he expressed and manifested his love even to those people that killed him. Bible says he prayed for them. And he said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And so God has called you and I to go back into the community to reflect the love of the kingdom. And that is to love all. And I know there are people within our circles, within the places where we work, in the marketplace. There are people all over that are unlovable because of their attitude. But Jesus calls us and gives us a grace that causes us to love even people that are not lovable. It means I don't have to only love people that are uh, expressing love towards me. It means I can even love people that I don't like. Hello? It's possible to love people you don't like. He didn't say like people. It's okay if you don't like them, but you can love them. And we know love is not emotions. Young people, love is not what? Young people, what is love? Not emotions. So if you feel a certain way about somebody, you feel a certain way about a girl, don't call that love. That is not love. That is called chemical imbalance in your brain. There are chemicals in your body. Sometimes some of them goes high and it makes you feel a certain way. It makes you feel attracted to somebody. That is why after a while you look at that same, body, that same person you felt a certain way about and you're like, what was I thinking? It was not about how you were thinking. It was about the chemicals that were imbalancing in your body. But the love Christ is calling us to is not chemical love. It is an unconditional love. It means regardless of how I feel, I got to stick with the decision I made. The love of God, which is agape, is unconditional. It is not based on the fact that you did something good to me, so I'm obligated to uh, reciprocate. It's not of that. It is only the love that is based on human standard that keeps fluctuating. If you are good to me, I'm good to you. When you withdraw your good towards me, I withdraw my goodness. That is not the love of God. The love of God is unconditional. That is why on your worst day, the love of God towards you is still the same. Even though you want to take your portion of inheritance prematurely and go spend it on riotous living, even though it is not in line with his will, he still loves you. Amen. The point is that he's not going to go into the pig pen with you as you waste your life on drugs and all the craziness, but he's going to be on the balcony waiting for your return to throw you a party because his love towards you never changes. And that is why the frugal son will not understand the father's love towards the prodigal son. Because he thinks he's been home all along doing all the right things. And I've never had the fattest lamb killed for him. So how would daddy want to throw a party for a wayward kid that's been gone spending all his inheritance on riotous living? But that is how deep the love of the father is. It's so deep that the, the frugal son can't even comprehend. And that is why sometimes God blesses you and a lot of people have a problem with it because they don't understand how you are still not complete and yet God is still favoring you. Can I be honest with you? In God's garden of grace, broken trees still bear fruit. And you and I, everybody, you, me, all of us are broken. And we got to understand this one revelation that in God's garden of grace, broken trees still bears fruit. And everybody listening to me this morning, whether you're on Zoom, wherever you are, you are broken. I am broken. We are broken. But we can still bear fruit. 
because of God's grace. Well, this morning, I want to share a few thoughts with you from the word. Well, this year, the Lord spoke to us clearly and said, it is time for community impact. Many years ago, I had a big church pastor in this area who said, well, I don't think God has called me to feed the hungry. God has not called me to feed the hungry. When I heard that, I, I thought for a moment, that doesn't sound like scriptures. God hasn't called me to feed the hungry. Well, our team scripture for this year is the book of Acts chapter 10 verse 38. If you could put it on the screen. Somebody can put a screen on. One of the TVs is off. All right. The book of Acts chapter 10 verse 38 says something so powerful. Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Think about it. Jesus was anointed by God with the Holy Ghost with power for a purpose. What was the purpose? That he would go into the community just to do good. If you are anointed, you cannot be good. Walking in goodness, the spirit of generosity is a gift. It's an anointing. Being generous to people is an anointing. People that are anointed and gifted with a grace to be generous. Please understand what it means. One of the gifts of the spirit is the gift of generosity. One of it is hospitality. There are believers that are hostile. It is the opposite of hospitality. There are believers that the attitude alone will not want you to have anything to the God they stand for. But the gift of hospitality, the gift of generosity, people that are gifted with generosity, this is how they operate. The anointing makes them to easily locate where there is wealth, where there is money, where there is resources. They just can smell it miles away. That is how the gift operate. And guess what? That same gift causes them to discover all those provisions, all those resources, and that same anointing makes them give it away. They don't hold on to it. It's called the gift of generosity. And those are the people God can trust with his wealth because he understands and believes that when he gives it to them, he can depend on them to supply the needs of people in community. And so God continues to bless them. And you don't understand. It's the reason why God continues to pour into them. Because God sees them as a conduit. He sees them as a tool for releasing his blessing. So he continues to pour. But the Bible says God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. With power. Who went about doing good. And you tell me I'm not called to feed the poor. Can I tell you a tradition that was in Israel. In Israel, we all know they were into agriculture. If you were called into agriculture in those days, you were required that when the season of harvest came, you left the four corners of your farm unharvested. It means you could harvest everything on the farm, but you were required to leave the four corners of your farm. And the reason why you left that four corners is so that those that are homeless, those who do not have food to eat, those that are hungry in community will come into your property. Your property. Your farm. Your land. They will come in. Whether they are coming from the east, there is a provision in that corner. They are coming from the west, there was a provision. They are coming from the south. Wherever, whichever direction, God required them to leave the four corners just for those who do not have need. In fact, Jesus said the poor would always, not sometimes, nobody can er eradicate poverty. He says the poor would always be among you. But God gives some of us enough so that we can become those that extends the hand of God to the community. So church is not just showing up on Sunday and feeling some Holy Ghost and having some goosebumps and dancing and walking away and ignoring people in community. Even back in the days, there was a provision for the poor. Oh, when you read the story of Naomi, Ruth, and uh, uh, um, uh, what's the name? Boaz. Bible says that Boaz even went a step further. Beside the four corners, he went a step further. And he told the harvesters, when you are harvesting, intentionally drop some. Drop some. 
It means that the, beside the ones that are made for the homeless people, drop some of the ones we also eat so that they can eat the type we eat. Some of us, no, there, there are people in church today, if you ask them to bring clothes so we're going to give it to the homeless, they look for the one they were wearing in 1912. The ones they wore in 1972. The ones they will not wear today. The outmoded ones, the obsolete. The ones you don't want to have anything. None of us will go to the store and say, I'm just going to Walmart today. I'm just shopping for the homeless. I'm buying them some new clothes. What makes you think you are better than them? Is it because they sleep on the street? I tell you, the more I get into the community, the more humble I become. Last Sunday, myself and Pastor Ella, we went to the Middletown Warming Center. And as I began to talk to the manager of the place, we brought them food like we've been doing throughout this whole winter. Because that is what God is calling us to do, people. He said, on that day, on that day, I watched you. I was homeless. You gave me no place to stay. I was hungry. You gave me no food to eat. I was in the hospital. You never came to visit me. I was in prison. You had nothing to do with me. There is a stigma on people that have been in prison before. But we know what God has called us to. We've had a testimony of Pastor Chris. How many years he spent in prison. But look at the lives he's impacted in the Bronx today. So God can transform lives. But we know the prison system don't transform. And so we must break those prison doors, get into those prisons with the gospel of the kingdom because there is only one thing that can transform. It is the word of God. No other system can transform. It is the word of God. If there are things in our community we want to see change, that change is only coming through the preaching and the teaching of the word. Nothing else will transform. Tell somebody nothing else. But the word. That's the only thing that transforms. But I love this because Jesus tells the disciples in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8. He says, you got to wait for this one thing. It's called the Holy Spirit. The paraclete. One called alongside to help. And the Holy Spirit is here to help us. But we need to embrace him. Jesus said, I'm going to bring you another of the same. Another of the same. Holy Spirit means another of the same. It means that the same way I was with you, to you, for you, this Holy Spirit coming will be the same for you, to you, and doing mightier things. Because now, you don't have to wait for me to come to your house to heal your child. The Holy Spirit is everywhere at the same time. So he says, greater works you are going to do in your season. But I think about the fact that even Jesus at a point had to go into somebody's farm to get some food to eat. Nobody called that stealing because it was the culture of the day. Jesus who could command five loaves and three fishes to feed thousands of people at a point in, in his life needed to go to somebody's farm to get some food to eat. Now I'm talking about Jesus who could walk on water still on the cross could say I'm thirsty. It means that no matter how powerful, no matter how rich you think you are today, there comes a time in your life where you will need something. Something. And sometimes what you need is not money. Because some of us, our confidence is in the fact that I have money, I have homes, I have houses, I have cars. God don't care about any of that. In fact, the Bible says the only thing that causes heaven to rejoice, when one person comes to stand here and say, I received the Lord. When you bought a new house, <laughs> heaven didn't care about it. There was no record of that. The only thing that is recorded is souls. 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 So where is your passion? You know, today when I think about how our attitude has even become in terms of the things of God, <laughs> you ask yourself, where is truly our heart? Where is our heart for the things of God? Because what are the things that really motivate you? 
Because the Bible says that where your treasure is, there, that same place, where your treasure is, the Bible says that is where your heart will also be. So where is your heart? Because the state of your heart reflects what treasure you treasure the most. What do you treasure? And I want to share something with you this morning that will help you rise up to the occasion. Because God doesn't care about titles. He doesn't care about how long you've been in the kingdom. There is something that is causing the heart of God to bleed. It is the craziness we see in society today. It is the level of liberalism we see in society today. I tell you what, prophetically, I can declare to you that a time is going to come. It's going to be a crime to speak against Satan. Oh, you got to think about that. And that's a prophetic statement. I'm not just speaking out of my mind. A time is going to come when you make any negative statement about Satan, you're going to go to jail. Because people are going to stand to say, I'm Satanist. That's my religion. How dare you say negativity about my religion? Because in this country, there is freedom of religion. It is because believers are asleep. And we get in there. That is why today somebody says, even though I'm born male, I feel I'm woman. Not only do we have transgender, we have gender fluidity. So you can be a man on Monday, be a woman on Tuesday, and be something else on Thursday. There are places in Europe right now you could pay to have sex with animals. It's happening right now. Bestiality. Because believers are sleeping. We enjoy coming to church, good music, good word. We go home, we sleep. We are not representing in the community. We are not becoming the ambassadors God wants us to be. We've been on the quiet. We, 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 we will stand for everything, but for the kingdom, we will not. Nobody in your circle knows you're a believer. The only person in your workplace that knows you're a believer is you. Nobody else in that office knows you're a believer. But I know in Antioch, the only reason why they call them believers is because of their lifestyle. The way they spoke, the way they conducted themselves, the way they conducted their business, the way they went about their life, preached volumes of sermons. Today, we cannot have the power of God anymore. We have to create it. We have to invent it. We have to do all kinds of things to reflect the power of God. Where is the real power of God? And I want to show you a few people in the early church who were not people that had titles. They were not ordained as apostles or pastors. They were ordinary believers doing great things for the kingdom of God. And so you don't need another title. You don't need a certificate to go out there. That lady that brought the entire village to Jesus at the well didn't go to a theological seminary. She had a five minutes encounter and she was ready to turn the city upside down. That blind man that lived all his life at a beautiful gate didn't have to have a, a month of training to go out there for evangelism. He said, one thing I know is that a minute ago I couldn't see y'all, but right now I can see. That was my testimony and it was enough to bring everybody to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. What has God done for you lately? Some of us are ready to take off our shirts because our favorite team is winning. We are jumping on tables and doing all kinds of crazy because the Yankees are winning, the Nets are winning, your team is winning, and you are cheering them. But nobody wants to cheer Jesus. Nobody wants to have anything to do with Jesus. The closest we come to is that I believe in God. But which God? Everybody talks about God, but which God? None of us want to talk about Jesus just because of the inconvenience of the name Jesus. So we hide under God. I believe in God. Everybody believes in God, but which God? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say I'm one of the ways. I am the way. I hear all kinds of pastors on social being, media being asked, are there many ways to, to God? And they are fumbling all over the place. Nobody can stand for Jesus. Pastors of mega churches leading 20,000 of people. And you ask yourself, where are they leading them to? Oh and simple question. And that is why I love people like Benny Hinn. Larry King asked him three times. Are there many ways 
to God. Are there alternative ways to God? And this is Benny Hinn's answer. The Bible says, and this is Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So are you saying that the Jewish people are going to hell? The Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So are you saying that the Muslims, and Larry King kept twisting the question, and his answer was the same. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then finally, Larry King says, Bernie, I think you're trying to hide behind the scriptures. And he said, there is no safer place to hide than under the scriptures. We cannot reinvent the scriptures because if God is subject to the word, Bible says he's lifted up the word above himself. So God will not do nothing beside what is already recorded in scripture. And that it's in itself a revelation to us that the word of God is the ultimate. And he says, nothing that is recorded in my word will fall to the ground. He says, nothing I have declared out of the word is coming back unto me void. Here we are creating all kinds of motivations and words that rhyme rather than the word, which is life. Jesus said it. He said, the words that I speak, they are spirit, they are life. And that is what we are supposed to declare. Glory to God. We are supposed to declare the word. Look at what the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 9. And I want to read from verse number 1. I think about great people like Paul. You, you have no idea the kind of people God is waiting on you to be used to impact. Some of them are going to be potential leaders in society. Some of them are going to be great evangelists. I told you the story of the pastor that spent many years in, in an African country. Uh, he got so disappointed because for him, he thought he was a failure. Because after being there for many years as a missionary, he never saw any group of people stabilize in the church. After a while, he got disappointed because his wife died in the course of that missionary trip and then his uh, only daughter decided not to come back with him when he decided to come back to Europe where he came from. And so he came back and backslided, started drinking. He was at the point of death and finally the daughter also had lost contact with this man. Eventually they reconnected. He brought him back to the country in Africa where he had spent all his life ministering. And he told the wife, uh, the daughter, I don't want to have anything to do with God. And his only reason is because he spent almost 25 years in an African country. Uh, the wife died during that missionary journey. Uh, his only daughter decided to stay and didn't want to have anything to do with him. But as the story goes, the daughter was able to convince him after he met. She met the father and brought him back. And then when they came back, the father was actually at the point of death because he was terribly sick. He had drunk, gotten himself into all kinds of liver cirrhosis and what have you. But then the amazing thing is that when he came back, the only biggest church in that community was being pastored. And it was actually founded by a pastor he had led to Christ in those days. The biggest church. I'm just trying to help somebody understand that you can never tell how many trees are in a seed. So what do you think you're not doing much? You think you're not doing enough? God is still. Bible says your seed sown will be multiplied. God has a way of uh, uh, re-echoing your footsteps. I, I think about the, 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 the leprous men that were thrown out of the city and they were not allowed to come back in because of their condition. But they made a decision. Either we remain here or die, go back into the city where we are going to be thrown back into this place anyway. Or you know what? Let's go into the camp of the enemy. And the Bible says, as they began to take steps, the enemies didn't hear the steps of leprous men. They heard the steps of chariots and horses. But that is what truly happens when you are walking in obedience. God amplifies your efforts. God increases and multiplies your effort. And the Bible says they got into the camp of the enemy and they were all gone. They fled because they thought an army was coming against them. Because in the realm of the spirit, those that are with us are more than those that are against us. And so as we discover the will of God and works and begin to take pursuit in his will, he begins to give us all kinds of supplies, from material to spiritual supplies. And that is what happened in the life of this leprous man. The book of Acts chapter 9, let's read from verse number 1. 
Can we have it on the screen? Praise God. Well, let's read this story that I believe would impact us because I think about people like Paul. We know Paul was a great man. Bible says from verse number one, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. <clears throat> he requested letters addressed to the synagogue in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found them. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Do you see his agenda? This is the agenda of our community today. They don't pick you up and kill you, but there are all kinds of things in place today to make sure your faith is killed. Is somebody listening to me? There are all kinds of agenda to make sure that the faith of believers are killed. Or look at the adjustment in our school system. Some of us don't even realize it. There is a whole lot of agenda in our school system. I'm talking about all the levels of liberalism going on in the school system. Our kids are being trained to embrace all kinds of craziness. And the church is quiet. The church is asleep. Bible says, whilst men slept, the enemy so tears. And there is a lot of sowing going on in our school system. The best some parents are doing is to homeschool their kids. But I have good news for you. That is not a perfect solution. Because when you are done schooling them, these same kids are coming back into the community. And they're going to have a cultural shock. Glory to God. God is giving us a better approach on dealing with this situation. <clears throat> Look at verse number three. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven. Say a light from heaven. A light from heaven. Come on, say a light from heaven. If you're on Facebook, type it out in the chat room, a light from heaven. You could type it on Zoom too. A light from heaven, Bible says, suddenly shone down around him. But that is what you need. That is what I need. That is what we need in Middletown. For light to shine down on community. For light to shine down on our youth. For light to shine down on our young adults. What they need is light in the midst of their darkness. There are too many people in darkness. I see people wasting away with weed. I see people wasting away with all kinds of things. So what we truly need is what? Light to shine in the darkness. Somebody lift your right hand and say, we need light in our community. Oh, come on, declare it. We need light in our community. Thank you, PC. That is what we truly need. Light in our community. The Bible says, Paul has an agenda. <laughs> His agenda is to get letters that empowered him. And those letters are not different from what is being signed by the house and the senate. They are getting letters. Yeah. On the quiet. Some of us, I hear believers say that, you know what, God has told me not to listen to the news. I said, really? Oh, the, the Holy Spirit, God will reveal to you what is happening in the community. If God is telling you not to listen to the news. When Jesus clearly says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, you cut ties with the world. Bible says we live in the world. This is where we are. But we are not part of the world. It's because we don't understand our place. An ambassador going to another country doesn't suddenly become a citizen of that country. He's still a citizen of where he's coming from. So we are still citizens of heaven. Even though we are here. It means that even though I am, and I, this is one thing we got to understand about culture and citizenship. Every culture goes with their language. It goes with their food. It goes with everything that embodies the culture. It's only believers that are adopting all kinds of craziness. What is your culture? What is your identity? Believers are losing their identity. We stand for nothing. We don't stand for anything right now as believers. What are our values? We want to be accepted. We want to be embraced by everybody. So just like Paul would say, and we will quote it out of context, he said, I became all things to all men that I may win some. It is not the becoming that matters, but the winning. The reason he became is to win people. Are you doing that to win people to the kingdom? Or you are doing that to be accepted by people? He said, I became all things 
to all men that I may win some. That is the goal. But we are hanging out at the same place they hang out because we want them to accept us. No, we want to embrace them and bring them to the kingdom. That is why we go out there. That must be the goal. And so the Bible says, a light shines around this man. And this man that is empowered have all these letters to go out and destroy believers. Bible says, as he was approaching Damascus, on this mission, on this mission, it means that you and I can stand in a place of prayer, that on this mission, as they stand to legislate all kinds of craziness in the house and the senate, a light will shine. Our kids are confused. Now they are saying that when you give birth to a child, don't put the agenda on the birth certificate till they are 18. What is so hard about checking out their genitals? What is so hard about that? Now what is so hard about that? Are we so crazy as a nation? Is that the level of knowledge we've got into that we cannot tell black from white? We cannot tell a boy from a girl? Now there are kids in class who says they are cat. You ask them, what is your name? Meow. In the class. And it's accepted. And there are human beings who are teachers in that class who can say nothing about it. Because when you say anything about it, you are discriminating. You are refusing to allow the child to be. To be crazy. Meow. If you are really a cat, you are not supposed to hang out with human beings. Go dwell among cats. That is where you truly belong because you are not a cat. If you are a cat, you will be with cats. Yeah. You should be eating cat food and not McDonald's. Yes. And we are embracing this. We are enabling it. The believers are saying nothing about it. We are quiet. Instead of us changing. Today there is a pastor in Georgia who says, you know what? Well, if they've legalized weed, I'm going to plant weed in my church. So that his reason is because he wants to attract the youth. When did weed become the way to change lives? When did weed become the way to impact lives? What happened to the power of God that fell on the day of Pentecost where people were pricked in their heart according to the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Bible says that they were pricked after Peter preached a simple message. He didn't have to bring weed. He preached a simple message in the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 38. You can put that on the screen. He says repent and be baptized. Repent. It wasn't just the words, but there was something powerful behind the word. The word was the life-giving force of Christ. There was the spirit of God that was active. There was an anointing that was in the word. That pricked their heart. When you read verse 41 of that scripture, Bible says when they heard that simple two-minute sermon, Bible says they were pricked in the heart. Pricked in the heart. There is a pricking force in the word. There is a powerful pricking force in the word. You cannot hear the word and go to sleep. Jeremiah said, when I even refuse to preach the word, it is like fire that is shut up in my bones. That is a fire. And the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. And if I'm preaching and declaring the word of God, it must consume the heart of the hearer. You read the book of Acts chapter 10 verse 44, 45. Bible says that Peter is invited to the house of Cornelius. And whilst he was preaching, he was not done preaching. Put that on the screen. Acts chapter 10 verse 44 and 45. Bible says whilst he was still preaching, he was not done preaching. The Holy Ghost came upon everybody that was listening to him. And suddenly, Bible says they stood up, they began to pray in tongues. Because the spirit was released through the preaching of the word. Recently, a young kid just died in this area. And this week on Monday, I sat down with one of the young men in the area. I was counseling him. I was, my heart is so moved towards these young people. I feel they are so confused. I feel they, they have no leadership. 
I feel the men who are supposed to lead the next generation, most of them are incarcerated. Some of them have run out of home. Some of them don't want to be fathers. They don't want to be husbands. They don't want to be responsible. And so we are raising a new generation that have no leadership. Forgetting that the Bible says if you strike the shepherd, the sheep will be scattered. We don't even understand that fathers are shepherds. And that is why the enemy is doing everything possible to incarcerate black and brown men and make sure that there are no shepherds at home. I tell you one day when I sat with my daughters and my older daughter told me, uh, I was trying to figure out why they've been good kids so far. One of the things she said is that anytime I will come home, I knew you'll be there. So it put some fear in me. Just you sitting down as a father, as a husband, not even saying anything. Just your presence. That is why we don't even understand the offices God calls us to. It is not about you raising your voice. Your presence there is a presence you carry. That is why even if you put a dummy in the White House, it becomes powerful. Because it's not a dummy, it's the office. Yes. So you being a husband or a father, it's not a point. But the office you occupy. You could be a dummy man, but once you become a husband. It's just like the blessings that goes with marriage. Anyone, anyone who finds a woman. Finds a good thing. Anyone. Anyone. I mean anyone. Who finds a woman. Finds a good thing. And Bible says for finding. You get a finder's fee. Obtains favor. That's what the Bible says. Mm. Glory to God. I hope somebody is hearing the word. Let's go back to the scripture we're reading. The book of Acts chapter 9. I think we were on verse number 5. God wants to touch a life this morning. God wants you to wake up. He wants you to realize that ordinary people can be used. And it doesn't matter. God is sick and tired of organized church like this. We just come sit down, hear something, go back, go about our business as always. And not impacting any other lives. Church is never complete. If your life is not impacting anybody. Anybody you meet must hear about your Jesus. I don't care who you are. I don't care about the transaction we have it. Jesus must be at the center of it. Some of us are so cute, we don't want to talk about Jesus. Really. Look at the scripture again, chapter 9 and verse number 5. Bible says, this man fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, he asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Look at verse number six, and let's read on. Now get up. I love this. He says, now get up. Go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up. He got up from there, and look at verse number seven. He got up the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing so they led him by the hand into damascus for three days he was blind god needs to humble some people that are riding their high horses so for three days this man could not see he did not eat and drank nothing and then verse 10 says in damascus there was an ordinary believer this is the point i want to bring home as I bring this teaching to a close. Bible says in Damascus, I mean in Middletown, there was a disciple, not a pastor. Not an apostle, not a prophet. There was a simple, ordinary Christian called Ananias. He doesn't have a title. He doesn't have a position. Ordinary believers like Sister Emily. Ordinary believer. And he's about to be used by God. To minister deliverance to the greatest apostle of all time. Apostle Paul. <laughs> Ordinary believer. Ordinary believer about to bring healing, salvation, restoration to the greatest apostle of all time. The man that has books in the inside of him. Epistles in the inside of him. The man that is ready to impact all the Gentiles and bring the gospel to Asia, to Europe, to everywhere. He's about to be led to Christ by an ordinary believer. An ordinary believer. 
ordinary Christian, a believer who is not perfect because he understands that in the garden of God, the garden of grace, broken trees can flourish. Broken trees can bear fruit. And he understands everybody is broken anyway. Everybody. A disciple. Look at the description. A disciple. Somebody who is still being discipled. Named Ananias. God also talked to ordinary believers. Now the Lord called to him in a vision. And said, Ananias. He said, yes, Lord. Verse 11. Now God is dealing with him. And remember, Paul is in Damascus for three days. Let's go on. Now in verse 11, can you put that on the screen? The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. So we know that three days this guy is not eating. He's not just starving. He's fasting. I'm talking about Apostle Paul because he's praying along with not eating. That's called fasting. Let's go. Verse 12. Let's finish this right now. Let's go to verse number 12. So in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. That is what Paul is seeing. And that is what God is revealing to Ananias. That Paul is seeing a man coming called Ananias who is going to lay hands on him and he's going to restore his eyesight. An ordinary believer is bringing healing. Oh, say, it is me. Come and declare it. It is me. God can use me as an ordinary believer to bring healing, to bring deliverance, and to bring restoration to my community. Lift your two hands and say, Lord, I'm ready. Hallelujah. Look at verse number 13. Bible says that God reveals to this man that it is time for you to go meet the man Saul. Verse 13. Put it on the screen. I love this. I love this. Because you might think that Paul's status should require him to be encountered by a big man of God. Sometimes the only way God wants to break the pride of certain people in society and communities to humble them. Bible says, do you see your calling? How not many mighty? How not many anointed? How not many noble? But God has taken the base things of this world to confound the wise. Amen. The ordinary, the nobodies. You know, the other time uh, a great man of God in Africa was interviewed and he was asked, you've been in ministry for so long. Uh, Duncan Williams, what is your greatest regret in life? He said, my greatest regret in life is making ordinary people somebodies. He said, what do you mean? He said, my greatest regret is making ordinary people or nobodies somebodies and then the, the, the nobodies who became somebodies now think that I am nobody. <laughs> so I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, God will use me to pick up people that are nobodies. And then through that relationship, they become somebody. Now, when they become somebody, they look at me and they think I'm nobody. He said, this is my biggest regret. Yeah. And then he went on to say, yes, this is my biggest re regret, but this is what it ought to be. He said, this is what it ought to be. And then he said, you know what? The, the people that have the greatest number of people leave their church are people that are truly empowering people. Because when you empower them, after a while they feel they've become so powerful they can do it by themselves. So when people are leaving, it means you're empowering them. But it doesn't necessarily mean they should leave. But it is their mindset that they've been empowered so they could do it by themselves. So don't be discouraged because you know what? That in itself is a sign that you are doing the right thing. You are empowering them. Because there are churches that will never empower you. They will make you feel that without a pastor you could do nothing. No. That is called witchcraft. It's called manipulation. When you're not telling people the truth and you're manipulating them. Do that. Do this. Do that. You are manipulating them. It's a form of witchcraft. Because witchcraft is manipulation. All right, let's finish this and get to the Lord's table. Look at verse number 13. Is that where we were? But Lord exclaimed, Ananias, I've heard many people talk about, about terrible things about this man. 
and things that he has done to believers. And you want me to go to him and minister to him? And the Lord said, he is authorized. And he said, in case you don't know. And I'm wondering, sometimes the things we post to God, as if God is not Jehovah omniscient. He knows it already. So how dare you rehearse all these things back to him? That, hey, God, this guy you sent him into, you know, I've heard stuff about him. He's taking letters. He's going about killing believers. I said, God doesn't know. He knows it all. But 15, he says, but the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings. Can you imagine the people that are waiting to be impacted by you? Ordinary believers, people that God is anointed, prepared to minister to Gentiles, to kings, and as well as the people of Israel. Great people are waiting for your impact. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul. He said, Brother Saul. <laughs> brother Saul the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might again regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit so can you imagine brother Ananias was the one that released the Holy Ghost on Apostle Paul <laughs> I remember one time um, this movie actor forgotten his name Tyler Perry Donated a one million dollar to T.D. Jakes, and in the midst of the presentation, he laid hands on T.D. Jakes, and T.D. Jakes felt that it was a big issue. But I don't know what to make of that. But this is the point: God uses a simple believer, a baby believer, if you will, somebody that has no title, and he goes into the house where this man that is yet to be a powerful apostle of God is. He lays hands. His his eyesight is restored, and not only that, he lays hands and he receives the Holy Ghost. Mm, you are powerful, and you don't even know. <laughs> Like Jacob, he said, this is actually the, that stairway to heaven. And I've been laying here all this time without even realizing that. You carry the anointing of the Lord. You carry the power of God. The Holy Spirit is inside you. The greater one dwells in the inside of you. And God is waiting for you to get into community and bring a change. Hallelujah. Bible says in verse number 18, instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Oh man, he baptized him with water. He baptized him with the Holy Ghost. He brought him salvation and he brought him healing. Ordinary believer. Ordinary believer. Ordinary believer, I'm speaking to you, child of God. You may be an ordinary believer, but you are empowered to bring change to community. Ordinary believer. He says, I will make your face like fling stone. You will not be afraid of their faces. God wants you to get out there and bring change to that community. It doesn't matter how old you are. You might be 15 years, Kiki. You might be just 15 years. You can go into the community and bring change 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 be an agent of change wherever you are you can bring change god's anointing is upon you and so the bible says that now instantly healing comes afterwards he ate some food he regained his strength but i'm just thinking how could god bypass all the peters all the andrew all the Philip, all these great people, and use an ordinary member in the church. Because what we fail to realize is that that ordinary member in the church was praying and commanding lightning of God to bring judgment. It was his prayer that released the lightning of God that hit him on the road to Damascus. The man was praying. The man was praying for a revival. The man was praying for a great awakening. The man was praying for a change in a community. You know, the best we do as believers is to talk about the problems in community. That's the best. Talk about it. Look at what they're doing. Look at what they're doing to our community. Look at what they're doing to our country. Forgetting that God doesn't hear complaint. He hears prayer. The angels are not activated by complaint. The angels are not activated by casual conversations. They are not activated by gossip. 
They are activated by prayer. That is why the Bible says in all things, by talking about it, by gossiping about it, by writing on it on social media, he says by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. We would rather do more of the talking than making our request known to God. What are you telling God? I tell you there was a prophet in his days, he was tired of telling God, when he got letters from the community, he brought it to church and laid it in the altar. And he said, God, this one, we have to read it together. He said, God, behold their threatenings. He brought a letter. He said, God, behold their threatenings. And I love this because when I think about all the many things that are going on in our community, the only thing I can think of is the fact that it is time for us to change as God's people. Yesterday, those of you that were in my class, I, I used the snake as an example. The snake, a lot of people think is so evil because of what it did to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But God uses the snake. In fact, God uses the snake to exemplify himself. So the snake is not a devil. <laughs> hey, snake. Hey. Anytime we think about snake, the next thing that comes into our mind is the devil. But there is more of snake representing the power of God in the Bible than the power of the devil. In fact, the devil has no power to create snake. He only used the snake as a conduit for his agenda. And that is what he does every day. Anything God creates, he does what? He takes it and uses it for his own agenda. God is the one that created a snake. And that is why when the children of Israel sin against God, God sends snakes among them to bite them so they get killed. But at the same time, God told Moses, I wanted to take brass and make us a snake, a shape of a snake and put on a rod. And anybody that is bitten by that snake looks at the snake in the realm of the spirit up there will be healed. So there is a snake down here and there is a snake up there. He says, when you have challenges with snakes down here, you got to look at the snake up there. When Moses met God, God said, what do you have in your hand? You're so scared to go back to Egypt to deliver them. He said, I have a rod. I have a staff. God said, put it down. It turned into what? The devil? It turned into a snake. Was that a devil? No. No. And Moses ran like you. Until Mikey just ran. But when he got to Egypt and the devil began replicating what God does, through the magicians of Pharaoh, they also brought rod and they dropped it. It turned into a snake. His rod also was dropped. It turned into a bigger and a better snake. And his snake swallowed the snakes of Pharaoh. That was not a snake of the devil. It was God's power. So when Jesus comes in the book of Matthew and he says, I'm sending you out to a world full of wolves, but I want you to be as wise as serpents. He wasn't trying to ask you to be as, white as, as wise as a devil. He says, I want you to be as wise as a serpent, yet harmless like a dove. And so there are things we got to learn from a serpent. And like I said yesterday, snakes change their skin three to twelve times within a year. Three to 12 times a year. They change their skin. Uh, I know most of you have seen snake skins all over the place and it freaks you out. They do it three to 12 times in a year. And the reason they do it is because their skin never grows, but their body grows. So they understand a season is coming where this body that is growing can no longer live in this skin that is not growing. And so what do they do? They begin to rub their head on abrasive materials like stones and rocks until that head pops the skin. And they begin to go through narrow places. I'm talking about some of the narrow things, narrow situations you're going through, you're feeling uncomfortable. But it's getting the old skin away. Because you don't put a new wine in an old wine skin, you got to get the old wine skin away. And so they begin to go through all these narrow places. And as I'm talking right now, somebody is in a narrow financial place. It is because God is getting ready to get that old skin and give you a new revelation of the new place is bringing you like a serpent. And then finally, they move out. 
I realize that snakes don't have eyelids. They have eye caps. And so when their skin gets covered with this whole situation, their eyes become opaque. They can't see because even their eyes are covered. And so the reason why they got to come out of this skin is because they need vision. They need eyesight. They don't want to grow up in darkness. They need to come out and get new revelation for the new season. And this is where it gets scary because when a snake is going through that season of its life, it doesn't have to be disturbed. And like Jesus, we must know when to even withdraw. Because when Jesus withdrew, it was a time none of us will withdraw. That was a time he had just fed 5,000 people. And the next the Bible says he withdrew to have a time to reset. Why do you withdraw when ministry is at its peak? You should be on high. Real estate is high. Markets are high, but prices are high, people are buying, business is booming, and you're like, I'm taking a break. That's the wrong time. Bible says, just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are the ways of God. So you are not a natural canal man. You're a man of, of the spirit. You're a woman of the spirit. So your move might not make sense to the ordinary people, but if you are truly led by God, you are the son of God. And so... The snake eventually comes out. But you know what? If the snake is not able to get this whole skin out, two things happen to the snake. The other reason why it got to get rid of the old skin is because viruses and bacteria are in the skin. And so if it doesn't get it out, it's a place for getting infection. And some of these infections can kill the snake. If it's not able to get all the entire skin out. You see how the whole thing comes in a hole? If it doesn't get the whole thing and a portion of it gets stuck on the body, it is bacteria that is stuck on the body. That can bring diseases that could potentially kill it. And not only that, if it doesn't get all the skin around its face off, it can become permanently blind. And I'm talking about relationships some of us are stuck in. It blinds us from what God is showing us. I'm talking about jobs that you've held on to so strong. God is even showing you something. You know, like, I'm stuck on this. It's, it's going to be this one here. And like I said, last Friday or so, even some of the songs we sing, we must stop singing them. Was it on Wednesday I said that? As old as you are, you remain the same. We're singing that about God. God is old. Do you know his birth certificate? <laughs> as old as you are, you remain the same. God doesn't remain the same. He says, even my mercies are renewed every morning. So God is getting ready to do some new things with us, people of God. And we got to rise up to the occasion, the new things God is doing. And the only way we can embrace the new thing is when we let go, like the serpent, the old skin. And when a snake finally does that, it's just like the eagle. And I'm going to finish with that. When an eagle is getting ready for the season, eagles like to soar. And when an eagle is getting ready for the new season, an eagle will go on a mountain top and use its own pig to pluck its feathers. It's a bloody sin. When you see an eagle plucking its own feathers, it's a painful sin, it's a bloody sin, but the eagle doesn't allow anybody to do it for itself. It does that to itself because the eagle understands that a new season is coming and this old feathers ain't going to get me there. So I got to plug it. I'm talking about things in our lives that we need to plug out. Vices, sins. All the hindrances the enemy is happy to have in our lives. All the limitations. God wants you to pluck it out like the eagle. Because a new season is coming. God wants you to soar up to new levels in life. And those feathers will not take you there. God wants you to plug it. Let go of the old. This morning we're going to come to the Lord's table. And as we come, I want you to think about the word of God. That if God could use ordinary people. Like Ananias, God can use me too. Tell him, God, you can use me too. Oh, come on, say it again. God, you can use me too. Hallelujah. And so, God, we just want to thank you for your broken body and your shed blood. 
And Lord, today as we come to this great table of your elements, we pray for an encounter with you. We pray that God, the power of the body of Jesus will become our portion. Your word declares in the book of Isaiah that by your stripes we are healed. And Lord, we know you were bruised so that we can walk in healing. And so, Lord, today I pray that as your people partake of these elements, there shall be a manifestation of healing, there shall be a manifestation of deliverance. And, Lord, your word declares that through the blood, through the blood and the word, there is victory over the work of the enemy. And so, Lord, we'll receive all that as we come to this great table. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So if you are on Zoom, as always, I wanted to join us with your bread and with your wine. If you have juice at home, you could take that and join us. If you have bread, cookies, anything that could represent the broken body of Jesus, take it with your family around the table and join us. Join us. We're going to do this in unity. Minister Tom, you could join us. Sister Cheryl, Brother Godfrey, I see all of you. Pastor Marcia, Sister Danny, get the elements with your family, with your spouse, with your children. Brother Kevin, all of you, join us. Sister Essie, all of you, I wanted to take it. Sister Mavis, Brother Pavel, all of you, I'm calling your name because I want you to know that we are together in the spirit. God wants us to do this together in unison. Even if I don't call your name, you know you are here and you are part of what God is doing. So I wanted to take the elements and we're going to do this in unison. We're going to do it together. And the power of God is going to minister to us. And those of you in the building, we're doing it together as well. So please go ahead. Go ahead, take the elements. And let us have a great time, Sister Denisha. Take it, Sister Roxanne. Take it, Brynell. Take it. Let's, let's come together and take it in unison. If you're in a building, I wanted to take the bread. And I wanted to think about these words. Bible says, the night before Jesus will be killed, he sat at a table with his disciples. He took bread, he gave thanks, and he said, this is my body that is broken. And Isaiah prophesies years before that, and he says, by the stripes in this body, you and I, you and I, all of us, the people of God, partakers of this broken body, we are healed. But I wanted to think about this. Bible talks about bruising. Bruising is something that is not visible yet under the skin. There are things and conditions going on in your life right now that might not be visible. It could be depression. It could be anxiety. It could be something you're dealing with. You come to church, you smile, everything looks nice. But in the inside, something is eating you up. I wanted to know the power in this broken body. When your faith is released along, brings healing. Not just to the body. But even emotionally, God wants to restore you. And so I wanted to release your faith right now. And with faith, I wanted to take this broken body of the Lamb. You know, Bible says in that same manner, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he said, this is... The blood of the new covenant. I think about how Bible says even before the foundations of the earth, the lamb was killed. So even before God started creating the earth, he had a provision and a plan in place. And so even in the Old Testament, he would tell Moses that, you know what, the angel is of death is passing, but I want you to take the blood of the lamb and post it on your door. So that as the angel passes, any door with a stain of the blood will be exempted of the calamity that was to come upon the land. I want you to understand that this blood here exempts you from every evil upon the land. And think about what John the Revelator says in the book of Revelation. He said they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. It means that this blood is a blood of victory. I don't know what has been said against you. I don't know what has been written against you medically. I don't know what the doctors have even said about you. But I want you to know that this blood of the Lamb gives you victory over disease. 
This blood of the Lamb gives you victory over every attack of the enemy. Every attack against your body. Your victory is in the blood of the Lamb. I want you to release your faith as you take the shed blood of the Lamb. And you could just begin to thank him for victory. All over this place, all over social media, begin to thank God for the victory. There is victory for us. There is victory for you and I. Hallelujah. Father, we receive victory this morning. over your life right now I speak God's protection over your life and over every member of your family I declare the covering of God over you I pray that in your going out and in your coming in the Lord will hide you from harm I pray that God's anointing will be stirred up within you today that even as God prepares us for community the spirit of boldness will take over. The spirit of confidence that which God is even preparing you and I for in the community. His anointing will take over our lives. That you and I will be sold out for this assignment. May your mouth be like an arrow that is ready to strike through the community with the power of the word. I pray God's blessings over you and your family. I pray that God will continue to supply provision to your family. And if there be any need in your life and that of your family, I pray that God brings it through even now. I declare healing of the body, healing of the mind, healing of the soul. I speak restoration over you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive the power of God, receive healing, receive restoration wherever you are. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Let's celebrate God. Let's celebrate Him for His goodness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may take your seat for a minute. We're going to come to the Lord with our substance, with our giving. As a church, we give, and the reason why we give is because we believe the principle of the word that when we give, we receive. That is what the Bible says. Is that correct? It says you are more blessed in giving than in receiving. Your giving allows us to be a blessing to the community. It allows us to finance our operations as a ministry. And so if you are in a building today, you want to give, please lift your hands. We have envelopes that we could give on the screen also in a minute. You're going to see how you can also give virtually. Those of you on social media, you could join us in this powerful portion of our service. You can sow a seed. You can bring your tithe. You can bring your first fruit. You can bring an offering. Whatever the Lord lays on your heart, you are at liberty to bring. You should not give under any kind of uh, compulsion. You want to give uh, as the scripture says with a cheerful heart because that is the only way the Lord blesses us when we give not because we are manipulated we give because we love God and we love supporting the things of God Pastor Chris would you please speak over our seat as we bring our tithes and offerings before the Lord Hallelujah
Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. What an incredible word we received this morning. Can we give, an, uh, can we give a, an applause unto the Lord? Can we put our hands together for using our apostle wonderfully this morning? You never know what type of seed you're planting. Amen. Praise God. You never know how many trees come from just one seed. This is our opportunity to pray over our seed. So if we can, and the time's already, your, office, your offerings are ready, please stand as we uh, lift up our offerings and our tithes unto the Lord. And we thank God. Amen. Father, we bless you this morning. And we thank you, Lord, that as we come to your altar, Lord, we lay what you have given us already back at your feet. We do it in faith, Lord. Sowing into the kingdom, knowing, Lord, that it is covenant. We thank you for all that you have given us in our lives. And with these offerings and with these times, we just come to say thank you. That nothing in our lives, no area of our lives, will you not provide what we need. That we walk away with the blessed assurance of your covering, even this morning. And these that we lay at your feet, we just thank you, Lord. That you will expound them, that you will multiply them, that the windows of heaven in our life will be open with blessing and with favor, with grace, my God, and power to be the people of God you created us to be. And so we joyfully give back unto the kingdom. We joyfully lay these tithes and offerings down that your storehouses will be filled and that nothing in our lives will have any lack at all but we will have an abundant overflow of the kingdom purposes and the kingdom resources of God amen and so we give you praise we give you honor and we give you glory and everybody in the house said amen hallelujah amen give the Lord a hand clap to me Jesus. So we sing like this. Who can stand against the Lord? No one can. No one will. Who can stand against the King? No one can. No one Victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to Him. Oh, 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 oh. Victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to Him. Oh, 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 oh. Victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to him. Hallelujah. A few announcements before we go to the lower level for lunch. Tomorrow, 
As always, we start our week with prayer. I invite all of you to join us on our prayer conference line at 6 o'clock in the morning. In the evening at 8 o'clock, our men will be having uh, their bi-weekly meeting. Also on Zoom, I encourage all of you to join us. And don't forget Wednesday, we are starting a new series on our interactive Bible studies. The time is 7.30. And then, of course, on uh, Friday at 7.30, we are also praying, as always. Please join us. All these two meetings are on Zoom. And then, of course, Saturday in the morning, we start our weekend with prayer. So please join us. If you're part of Legacy Life University, our class is 9 a.m. on Saturday. And, of course, on Sunday, we are back in the building. The Bronx will meet in their new location. The Bronx has a new and a bigger location. Let's celebrate God for that. Amen. And so next Sunday, uh, we're going to be in the Bronx and uh, the time, same time, 11 a.m. And we're going to be here as well, same time, 11 a.m. So please, if you're in the Bronx, join us. Those of you that have been home for a while, uh, I dare you to show up in the Bronx if you're in the city. You know, yeah, Pastor Chris says I should dare you to show up in the Bronx. <laughs> Hallelujah. What's the new address again? 3464. 3464 Webster Avenue. It's at the corner of Webster and Gun Hill Road. You can't miss it. The five train, the two train, and you have bus that stops right in front of the church. It's going to be a powerful time next Sunday. I look forward. And uh, I'm going to be in the Bronx as a matter of fact next week. So praise God. Praise God. Amen. Now, we never finish our service without loving on our first-time visitors. We have special gifts for them. So please, today, if today is your first time in this building, we want you to do as the honor by rising up for a minute. We want to come to you and love on you and bring you some information that we have for you. So would you please do as the honor to rise up? And uh, if today is your first Sunday, please. Come on, let's go to them, love on them, celebrate them. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you so much for coming. We really do appreciate you. And if you're on social media, today is your first time joining in as well. On social media, in the chat room, we have a link. We would love for you to fill it up. And uh, media team, make sure you put a link there for them. Fill it up and hit the submit because that is the only way we can get it back. And uh, we we'll look forward to a great time with you. Ushers, let's bring them the materials, each of them. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so very much for coming. And so if uh, we just wanted to know that in case you don't have a place you call your church family, this is a great place to belong and uh, we will be so excited to have you join us as part of this ministry as we get into the community to do the kingdom assignment God has given us. And also, we wanted to know we have a special brunch today, a full course buffet with food and beverage. I mean, think about it, coffee, everything you can imagine in our lower level. And this is specially prepared in your honor. And we don't want you to go home. We want you to come to the lower level to join us to have lunch with us. Amen. Now, two important dates I wanted to have you on your calendar on February 25th. February 25th. Please, I want to see you in this building. We're going to have a relationship conference. If you are dating, you are married, you are thinking of divorcing, whatever the case is, whatever level of relationship you have, I want you to come and receive empowerment. We're going to have people that are experiencing relationship talking to us on February 25th. It's going to be 11 in the morning. Is that correct? 11. So please, and uh, again, breakfast and lunch is going to be provided. And, uh, and so you have no reason to worry about any of that. Just come in, invite other friends, and let us come and celebrate relationship. February 25th, 11 a.m. And then March 25th, we also have our graduation. If you are part of Legacy Life, you are entitled to bring two other people or even more with you. Let us come and celebrate knowledge. Praise God. Amen. Were you blessed today? Yes. Amen. So we're going to go out into the community and do incredible things for the kingdom. Oh, yes. 
Yes, yes. I almost forgot that because I wasn't invited. You know, all the ladies, I hear there is a special luncheon going on at the lower level for you. So you guys, we will do our own thing. Don't worry. We will do our own thing. Why is it doing their own thing? <laughs> so the ladies have a special, every lady in the building, you are invited to join. I had some of the things they're going to be doing, and I thought that it was really fun. We're going to be doing some stuff, too, with the men. Maybe we'll go somewhere in the cold and do some push-ups, some manly thing. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. Let's rise up as we close. Please lift your hands. May the Lord bless you and favor you. May the Lord cause his face to shine towards you. May your going out be blessed, and so you're coming in. May your down sitting be blessed and so your uprising. May everything you do in this season turn into blessing. I pray that God would anoint you specially in this season to do great works for the kingdom. May the Lord fill your mouth with his word. That as you go, your mouth will be his mouthpiece and your hand will be an extension of his hand. May the Lord use you to even point people to the kingdom of God. May you be an instrument in the hand of God that turns the heart of many unto him. And now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever imagine or even think of. Unto the only wise God who today anoints you like he did with Jesus who went about doing good. Unto him alone be all glory even now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you family. See you